Are you the type of TFT player that hates playing the same composition every single game? Do you enjoy big verticals and unlocking the maximum potential of your composition? Well, what if I told you that you could achieve both while not getting lost in your roll downs and getting dizzy with all of your options? Let me introduce you to the latest legends that's taking the meta by storm, Earth. Here are the four ingredients that you need to cook up a delicious meal of Earth and Turb, as well as my guide on all the best holders of each emblem. Step zero, before you begin, pick that Earth legend in the menus. You'll be picking his two on augment the majority the time and play around whatever emblem that you can get. Ingredient number one, tailor your board for your 2-1 Tome of Traits. At stage 1-4, place units on the board whose traits you want to potentially hit with your Tome of Traits. You want to have at least 6 traits on the board so you can get one tailored emblem. This is because the rule of Tome of Traits is that at 6, 8, 10, and 12 traits, you get 1, 2, 3, or 4 tailored traits respectively. The best unit in general to put on 1-4 is Teemo, because you can't get Multicaster or Yordle emblem. They don't currently exist in this set. This also means any other Multicaster or Yordle is potentially a good inclusion. So the Yordle of Tristana, Kled, and Poppy, and the Multicaster of Velkaz, Sona, and Talia won't count towards your emblems. You also want to include some of your personal favorites that you feel comfortable playing around. For myself, it's units like Callista, Malzahar, Irelia, and Samira, and Echo. Your favorites will change each patch depending on what is good. In this case, I value things like Shadow Isles, Piltover, Sorcerer, Ionia, and Challengers, and maybe even Void. The general rule here that I follow is to have at least five out of six trades that I'm happy to get an emblem for. If you don't tail your board, that's not the end of the world. Just be prepared to play some wacky lines when you do. Ingredient number two, aim for a strong early game by playing around your traits. In some instances, you'll be able to level the four and maintain an early economy while getting power in your traits. Some powerful four-piece early game traits include Sorcerer, Challenger, and Bastions. But you could easily mix in a three-piece plus one, such as Noxious plus Challenger, or three Voids and a Sorcerer. The only exceptions are loose streak oriented traits like Piltover, but more on that later. It's important to play around any two-star that you can can hit and give them that emblem, even if it doesn't fit in with any other trait. For example, if you get a two-star Renekton but get a Shadow Isle emblem, you should just play that two-star Renekton for tempo and give them the emblem until you hit something better. Let the power of the traits help amplify the effectiveness of your units. Lastly, don't focus too hard on trying to force a win streak by early leveling. Instead, focus on building your economy because you may need that if you need to hit a key four or five cost piece later on in the game. Number three, identify your win condition. Here we encounter one of the most important questions you can ever ask yourself in a TFT game. What is my win condition? We need to figure out what exactly is the way for our comp to land a top four or better and chase after that. But remember, it differs for each comp and emblem. An easy example that I can think of is 8 Void. Our win condition in this instance will be to chase 8 Void and hit Belveth as soon as possible, meaning we need to econ up and get to level 8 or 9. But then the million dollar question is, how do I identify that win condition? I'll give you some answers for this current patch and then show you how to find the answers yourself for the future. Currently on 1315, the best win conditions based on emblems are 6 Noxus for Cat, Darius, and Samira boards, 5 to 6 Slayer for Kale, Gwen, and Zed boards, 4 Frailyard for the AD carry boards, 6 Zon for powerful mods on Jarvan and Scion, 6 Shadow Isles for Gwen Senna boards, 8 Challengers for the Kaisa Yasuo boards, and 8 Sorcerers for the Lux Ari boards. There's even more conditional scenarios I haven't mentioned, but these should be the most common. It's a lot to take in, I know, but if you want a good reference, go to your favorite stats website like Meta TFT or Tactics.tools, go to the items section, and filter for emblems only. From there, you'll be able to see who's the best holder of each emblem. And don't forget to check on things like the traits tab too, so you can see what has the best average placement and win rate and is worth chasing. Number four, identify and chase your ideal emblem holder. Don't just tunnel on the destination. It's important to figure out the path on how we end up getting there. In other words, who's going to be holding the emblem now? versus later. Let's start things off with the craftable emblems, aka things that you can combine with a spatula and a component. The main stat that you focus on with Ionia is attack speed. Samira is one of the best item holders in general in the game currently, and also very strong to link with the challengers. Diego is really good as a unit to link with Zed, as well as just a powerful AP item holder. Jinx is good because it links with the Zahn with the Warwick. Warwick tends to connect to your frontline with Set. Ash is also a link to Dead Eyes with Jin. Calissa is the best three cost holder of Ionia emblem, and you can even primary carry her if you three-star her. Aphelios is also another potential holder of Ionia Emblem, but you need to give him something like Last Whisper and a lot of AD with Deathblade. Gwen is oftentimes an item holder for Ionia Emblem as well, and it connects to units like Callista while giving you a lot of potential power if you're not hitting things like your Kaisa and your Yasuo. Legendaries in general love attack speed across the board, 
Heimerdinger is the best user of it because it shares attack speed with an Apex turret. Aatrox and Belveth are both units that scale with their attack speed. And Senna is also very good for the same reasons why Gwen is because it links to Shadow Isles as well as supports all those Challenger units with a bunch of shields. Challenger is very similar to Ionia because it gives attack speed as well. So you're going to see a lot of similarities that we don't have to cover too much more. The only difference at one cost is Jin, and it's good to get the attack speed so we can cast multiple times per fight. At three cost, you can give it to Akshan to link with that Jin and potentially get multiple casts. Gwen is actually a surprisingly pretty good user of Challenger, especially since it gives her a lot of uptime to dash towards another target and get that snip. And a lot of times in Challenger boards, if you're not linking with the Warwick, a lot of times you can play a Juggernaut frontline with Nasus. And the legendaries are the same as Ionia because Heimerdinger skills with attack speed as well as Aatrox and Belveth and Senna. The Shurima trait is focused on maximum health as well as attack speed, but you have to pick the strongest Shuriman, aka the unit that's holding the most items until you get 5, 7, or 9. So with that being said, any unit that benefits from that max HP and attack speed, we're going to put this on. Cho'Gath is a bruiser which links to Renekton. And Samir is a Noxus that links to the Cassiopeia. Vi is a bruiser for that Renekton as well at 2 cost. Galio is an invoker for that cast. Lissandra for the same reason at that 3 cost is an invoker, but it's not that good on her. Compared to, say, Sejuani, who is a good frontliner that you can put it on and also has that bruiser linked to Renekton. Shen is that better version of Galio and Lissandra as the invoker that can get that max HP. And that Legendaries, the best holder of it is Aatrox. Aatrox is a juggernaut that links to that Nasus. Heimerdinger is the best legendary in the game. So once again, give him that emblem so that he can fit into your board. And don't forget about Sai and Rise for the same reasons as before, a bruiser and an invoker. I do want to say that I think Nine Shurima might secretly be with the strongest trait in the game. It's just that people don't really get a chance to play it. Sorcerers are just a bunch of flat AP, but it also gives you a potential shock to the enemy based on their max HP when they die. At one cost, the best holder of it by far is Cassiopeia. There's no one else really that I want to put it on. At two cost, Soraka connects to the Taric for the Targon, and Teemo connects next to the strategist and multicasters for the trait. At three cost, the best is Sona, and I marked her as a three star because she even has potential to carry. It's a rare thing that you do, but every now and then it's actually quite strong. At four cost, there's only really Jarvan that you put it on, although sometimes you can justify putting it on Shen if you need more frontline. Usually, if you could choose between Sona and Jarvan, I put it on Sona first and then Jarvan if I have a second one. And at five cost, Heimerdinger, surprise, surprise, is very good. Also, he gets the AP that shares with the Apex turret. And then Senna is also good as well because she scales really well off of AP and a lot of utility. Juggernaut's actually quite flexible, very similar to like Bruiser or Bastion, just fine to splash into your composition. Juggernaut's really good with things that shield or heal. So Shadow Wilds, for example, is very good with it. Alkai with Juggernaut can also particularly be pretty solid, especially in real compositions like Tristana and Kale right now. At two cost, Cast and Swain are both tankier two cost that give extra HP. Cast gets a shield and Swain gains flat HP. At three cost, Katarina ends up holding Juggernaut Emblem a lot, especially in those six Noxus boards alongside Darius. This is because Darius is that Juggernaut and Katarina gets the damage reduction on top of that extra HP and healing. He's quite a force to be reckoned with. For four cost flex options, Gwen is the best four cost holder of it for the same reasons as before for Shadow Wild Shields and Shen for the same reason as well because he gets a lot of shielding. Sion and Cassante are the two best frontliners to hold Juggernaut Emblem for legendaries and Senna is good again because of that Shadow Wilds. For Noxus Emblems, you're actually not going to be flexing that much because you usually only have one extra spot for it and it's pretty obvious. At one cost, you give it to Malzahar or Irelia. Malzahar links to Swain, Irelia links links to Samira. Warwick is the most common two cost that you go for because he's a juggernaut for Darius and a challenger for Samira. And Set's just like an inferior version of Warwick, quite frankly. I'd rather play Warwick instead for the traits. The three cost ideal holder of Noxus is Echo, and you can even carry him if you give him three items with the Noxus stacks. He's a rogue and a Zon for that Warwick, so his traits fit very nicely. At four cost, you can also play the Shurima version with Nasus and Azir, although I do think it's a little bit weaker. It is possible, especially if you're high rolling and uncontested. Make sure that if you do go for the Nasus version, you have items for him. Chen is just a versatile holder of these stats and something that can link to potentially that Cassiopeia. And at five cost, anything that just, just give a lot of flat stats. So Aatrox, Heimerdinger, Rise, maybe even Belveth, but she's a lot weaker compared to these other three. Rise is more conditional, depends on the portal, but a lot of times he can actually do a lot, especially since a lot of the buffs to Rise have given him damage. So the Noxus is a big amplification to that. Demacia is very situational. Not many people are playing vertical Demacia, but if you get a Demacia emblem for some of those compositions like Reroll Kale, it can be decent. Best holder of it at one cost is Maokai because you can get a Radiant Frontline item which is solid at two cost it's swain and set because they're frontliners in general you're starting to recognize that most demacian emblems should go on frontliners because backliners are not very reliable with it the exception is velkaz and i have a suspicion that this is because of sorcerers if that's the case then you probably chase this as a three star maybe gwen is a slayer that often links to the kale and shen is really good to tie in your frontline Aatrox and cyan are also generically very good as those frontliners and you get those demacian radiant items slayers are a lot more flexible and versatile because you can just put it on anybody at one cost 
the best by far is Samira. In the rare instance, you get a lot of Slayer emblems and you're playing reroll KO. You can put that Slayer emblem on Poppy and it's actually not that bad. But you still generally prefer to have Radiant item plus two defensive items. There's no real good two cost of Slayer emblems. I looked around, not very recommended. Instead, you have a lot of three costs that are quite good with it, particularly Darius, Katarina, and Echo, specifically within the Noxus lines. You can also play them in the Zed lines as well as complementary carries alongside Zed and Gwen. Jarvan is a link to the KO reroll compositions that you end up playing Slayer in. And sometimes this dunk ends up doing a pretty good amount of damage to the back line. Nasus is low-key a very solid user of Slayer Emblem, but it's pretty impractical because you have to have a really good Noxus setup and that Shirima that we mentioned. It's almost kind of like a double emblem scenario where you get Noxus and Slayer and you put both on Nasus. And then the legendaries are pretty straightforward. Heimerdinger often ends up taking it. And then Rise, Scion, and Senna are also good holders of it as well. Let's talk about the uncraftables, the one that you can't make with the spatula. Bastion is actually quite a solid one to play around if you want to go vertical and combine it with Shadow Isles. This is because the shield with Shadow Isles is really good with the resistances that you get from Bastion. Also, a Bastion is actually a win condition with insane amounts of armor and MR, so definitely chase that if you can. Viego is the best holder of it because of the Shadow Isles shield. Sway and Soraka for that extra healing and flat HP. Lissandra ends up holding it a decent amount of time if you're playing the Invoker line. This is because she ends up being in the front two rows very often. Gwen is also very good in vertical Bastions, especially if you give her scaling items like Archangel Staff because she'll have so much tankiness. So she'll stall out and ramp up and get all that AP. For Legendaries, you end up putting a lot on Senna, Aatrox, Scion, on Belveth. You can pretty much tell like any unit that really matches well with Shadow Wiles or complements the front line. Belveth is basically if you just need another carry damage source because Bastion sometimes has too much defense and not enough offense. But I'd only play Belveth if I have ramping things and good items for her like that Rage Blade and RSC. Bruisers tend to link towards Rek'Sai builds. So you end up putting it on a lot of the extra Void units. At one cost, I'd recommend putting it on Malzahar. For two costs, Cassidy and Warwick do a really good job. Warwick is actually pretty solid because he actually does pretty good job tanking if you give him items early. Lissandra ends up taking the Bruiser if you end up playing Frailer alongside your six Bruisers. Shen and Urgot are two units that do well with a lot of HP. Urgot in particular if you get a good Zon mod that scales with it. Aatrox, Belveth, and Cassante are your best frontliners to hold the extra HP and benefit from it. Don't forget that Belveth actually scales off her maximum HP with her Empish traits, so getting her as a Bruiser can be quite valuable. Deadeye is a little bit unusual because there's not many good holders of it and you're not supposed to pick it that often. The reason why it doesn't really matter much who holds Deadeye Emblem is because every few seconds the Deadeye will attack and so it basically takes in the base stats into equation meaning if you're putting it on a one star unit the attack's not going to deal as much as just putting it on any two star unit. So the general rule of thumb is put it on a higher tier unit because you just get more value off the Deadeye. Samir and Jinx are the best early game users of it. You end up putting it a lot of times on units like Lissandra simply because you just don't have room for your Deadeye failure board. You can also justify putting it on Sejuani and Shen only if you have really good frontline already established. I will say that if you end up playing a Shreema variation with Akshan, Nasus with Deadeye and proper item and setup can actually pop off at times. And then the best two units are Senna and Belveth. But a lot of times you end up just putting it on Heimerdinger and Scion because they're just good units to include in your composition. Gunner is a little bit similar to Deadeye as in it doesn't really matter who you put it on as long as they can contribute towards the damage. It's just because there's not that many flex spots that you can put in to have a really strong combination. The best holder of Gunner right now is Samira because she's just the best one cost AD champion in the game. And Orianna ends up holding it a decent amount of times only because she's part of Piltover. Warwick is part of Zaun and Ash is a Deadeye that links to Urgot. Echo a lot of times actually ends up being the three cost holder of it. You can also justify putting on Lissandra again for the same reasons as before, which is Freljord and you don't have a better holder of it. Best holder of Gunner for the four cost is Urgot because he just gets that extra AD. But it's not like absurdly good on him or anything like that. So don't get too excited about Gunner on Urgot. I'd much rather have attack fighter items like BT Titans as opposed to just flat AD through Gunner. Heimerdinger and Scion end up being units that you include a lot of times in your Piltover in Gunner boards. And Belveth actually is a pretty good unit with Gunner, but you don't care that much about it again unless you have a lot of good items for her. Invokers are a lot more flexible depending on what the adjacent traits you have available. Irelia is really solid because you start off with Ionia and you can play around that Karma. Samira is a unit that links to the Cassiopeia and is just an insane unit in general. Set is an Ionia that links with that Karma. Swain is a Noxus that leads to that Cassiopeia as well. Taric ends up being a very good user of Invokers early game but then late game you want to find a replacement terror because you can put on a better unit instead if you want to put it on Yasuo to temporarily hold it for Ari that's a really common usage of it if you're in a situation where you can't get shred with invokers a lot of times people play Sejuani because it links to Lissandra Ari is the best invoker holder period so you want to give it to her as soon as you can and then if you also have extra ones you can try to include Heimerdinger and Senna as well Rogue is pretty bare bones there's not much flexibility with it but I want to shout out two things at one cost we have Cho'Gath aka Rogue Gath. I've only seen it succeed in match history profile and challenger. I've never actually seen it in game. But allegedly, if you have the spot for it, like a one in 1000 chance, Rogath apparently can be very good.
good. Other rogues include Kled and Darius for those Noxus links alongside Zed. Gwen is actually quite a solid rogue because she's much more consistent this patch. And Urgot's actually a really funny rogue because he gets kind of that edge of night effect, but also dashes to the back line and sometimes just two taps the enemy carry. And if you want to put it on the top end unit, I recommend putting it on Aatrox. Shadow House is my favorite emblem play around. And if I were to show you every possibility, the entire board would just be filled with champions. But the best ones at each tier is as such. Irelia is really good because you get more uptime on shields and her Ionia bonus is a magic resistance and armor. So you end up getting a lot of tankiness out of it. Poppy ends up being an insane holder of Shadow Isle emblem, especially in reroll compositions, such as Kale or Tristana. Four star Poppy with Shadow Isles is just not balanced at all. At two cost, Zed ends up being pretty good because of the Viego link. And then Soraka ends up being good with the Bastions and Targon. Shadow Isles and Targon currently right now is generally just an OP combo. So that's why you want to give it to Soraka or Taric if you do have extras. The best four cost to put it on right now is also Shen because of the damage reduction through Ionia, as well as the frequent amount of cast that he gets. He also can also hold Shadow Isle emblem and become a pretty reliable CC bot. So he ends up producing a lot of utility. He doesn't actually carry very much though. So if you give him Shadow Isle emblem plus a bunch of attack damage items, you might be disappointed. Another unit that you could potentially play as well as a shout out is Kaisa. But I think that Kaisa Shadow Isles is actually just weaker than the other four cost. The best holder at five cost is Kasante. This is an actual win condition, especially if you can give him other follow-up items like a Protector's Vow and War Monks. The others are pretty generically good legendaries like Heimerdinger, Scion, and Aatrox that you can always include in those boards. Last but not least is Zahn, and here are all the mods that you want to play with them. At one cost, Tristana ends up being the good Zahn holder with Robotic Arm. After that, it's a bunch of people who could hold Unstable Chem Tank. So you have Renekton and Vi because they're bruisers, so they have more HP. It says the Juggernaut ends up being pretty good, and remember that you also just get maximum HP as the mod, and so it ends up scaling with Juggernaut pretty well. But by far, without a doubt, the best holder of Unstable Chem Tank is Jarvan because he dives in and then explodes into the back line. Make sure to give him a Protector's Vow and a War Mogs if you can. So Juani is also a okay version of it because she is that bruiser and she's a reliable tank. The other ridiculous combination for Six Zon is Hextech Exoskeleton on Scion because when he resurrects, it counts as a heal. And so when that happens, 150% of that heal damage is done to the back line. Other good holders potentially are Rise and Heimerdinger depending on the Rise portal. And Heimerdinger is just because, well, you're playing a Heimerdinger on your board. The remaining five traits of Void, Freljord, Targon, Strategist, and Piltover don't really matter as long as you're not putting it on a unit that needs items, such as your carry or your tank. All right, chefs, you're almost done cooking, but here's a couple of bonus tips so you don't overheat. Bonus tip number one, should I take 3-2 and 4-2 augments? The 3-2 augments are actually quite solid. The best one is his silver at tiny grab bag because it gives you a good amount of resources. Big grab is also very good and is very similar to medium forge by Orn. The prismatic giant grab bag at 3-2 is a fallback option. You should only choose it if you don't have something better, but it's nice to have a guaranteed solid option. The 4-2 augments of final grab bags are mainly fallback options. So you end up picking them if you need a safe option that feels like it doesn't have much downside. I will say that Earth's grab bag is really good sometimes to cheese two-star legendaries. You hit something on seven, you get a pair of it on carousel, and bam, you got a two-star legendary in stage four. Bonus tip number two, when do I delay popping my Tome of Traits? One, if you're loose streaking and you can afford to wait. Or two, you have two Tomes from an Ancient Archives 2 prismatic choice and don't want to rip both Tomes immediately since you can get two very different emblems. I would recommend ripping one at the beginning of stage two and the second one towards the end of stage two. But remember, you need to tailor that board for a similar trait so that way you feel like you can play around both of them. Number three, is it okay to reforge my emblems if I don't like them? The answer to that is yes, if you're playing around augments like branching out and feel like you have an unplayable emblem. Try to do it earlier in the game rather than later though so that you have time to react and build around it. And remember that craftables can only turn into craftables and the same thing applies to uncraftables. So you can't turn a Demacian emblem into a Bruiser emblem or vice versa. And the final tip is how to toggle with Piltover. There's a secret interaction with Piltover to prevent your Lost Streak from getting snapped in stage two, where you purposefully sell the holder of Piltover emblem every round. You only do this if you know there's another open fort loose streak player in the lobby. Position so that you can choose to add the emblem on a non-Piltover unit and determine whether the loss is secured. If you will win, don't put the emblem on anyone so that even if you win, you won't cash out your Piltover T-Hex prematurely. So there you have it, chefs. My finest tips on cooking up the most delicious cuisines in all of Runeterra. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know any Earth tips that you have in the comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.